Theophrastus, a Greek native of Erisos in Lesbos, was the successor to Aristotle in the Peripatetic school. He came to Athens at a young age and initially studied in Plato's school. After Plato's death, he attached himself to Aristotle. Aristotle bequeathed to Theophrastus his writings and designated him as his successor at the Lyceum. Theophrastus presided over the Peripatetic school for 36 years, during which time the school flourished greatly. He is often considered the father of botany for his works on plants. After his death, the Athenians honored him with a public funeral. His successor as head of the school was Strata of Lampsacus. The interests of Theophrastus were wide-ranging, extending from biology and physics to ethics and metaphysics. His two surviving botanical works, Inquiry into Plants and On the Causes of Plants, were an important influence on Renaissance science. There are also surviving works on moral characters, on sensation, on stones, and fragments on physics and metaphysics. In philosophy, he studied grammar and language and continued Aristotle's work on logic. He also regarded space as the mere arrangement and position of bodies, time as an accident of motion, and motion as a necessary consequence of all activity. In ethics, he regarded happiness as depending on external influences as well as on virtue and famously said that life is ruled by fortune, not wisdom, life. Most of the biographical information we have of Theophrastus was provided by Diogenes Laertius' Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, written more than 400 years after Theophrastus' time. He was a native of Erisos in Lesbos. His given name was Titamus, but he later became known by the nickname Theophrastus, given to him, it is said, by Aristotle to indicate the grace of his conversation. After receiving instruction in philosophy in Lesbos from one Alcippus, he moved to Athens, where he may have studied under Plato. He became friends with Aristotle, and when Plato died Theophrastus may have joined Aristotle in his self-imposed exile from Athens. When Aristotle moved to Mytilene on Lesbos in 345 quarters, it is very likely that he did so at the urging of Theophrastus. It seems that it was on Lesbos that Aristotle and Theophrastus began their research into natural science, with Aristotle studying animals and Theophrastus studying plants. Theophrastus probably accompanied Aristotle to Macedonia when Aristotle was appointed tutor to Alexander the Great in 343 halves. Around 335 BC, Theophrastus moved with Aristotle to Athens where Aristotle began teaching in the Lyceum. When, after the death of Alexander, anti-Macedonian feeling forced Aristotle to leave Athens. Theophrastus remained behind as head of the Peripatetic School, a position he continued to hold after Aristotle's death in 322 over 1. Aristotle in his will made him guardian of his children, including Nicomachus with whom he was close. Aristotle likewise bequeathed to him his library and the originals of his works, and designated him as his successor at the Lyceum. Eudemus of Rhodes also had some claims to this position, and Aristoxenus is said to have resented Aristotle's choice. Theophrastus presided over the Peripatetic school for 35 years, and died at the age of 85 according to Diogenes. He is said to have remarked, we die just when we are beginning to live. Under his guidance the school flourished greatly. There were at one period more than 2,000 students, Diogenes affirms, and at his death, the comic poet Menander was among his pupils. His popularity was shown in the regard paid to him by Philip, Cassander, and Ptolemy, and by the complete failure of a charge of impiety brought against him. He was honored with a public funeral, and the whole population of Athens, honoring him greatly, followed him to the grave. He was succeeded as head of the Lyceum by Strata of Lampsacus. Writings From the list of Diogenes Laertius, giving 227 titles, it appears that the activity of Theophrastus extended over the whole field of contemporary knowledge. His writing probably differed little from Aristotle's treatment of the same themes, though supplementary in details.
Like Aristotle, most of his writings are lost works. Thus Theophrastus, like Aristotle, had composed a first and second analytic. He had also written books on topics, on the analysis of syllogisms, on sophisms and on affirmation and denial as well as on the natural philosophy, on heaven, and on meteorological phenomena. In addition, Theophrastus wrote on the warm and the cold, on water, fire, the sea, on coagulation and melting, on various phenomena of organic and spiritual life, and on the soul, on experience and on sense perception. Likewise, we find mention of monographs of Theophrastus on the early Greek philosophers Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Archelaus. Diogenes of Apollonia, Democritus, which were made use of by Simplicius, and also on Xenocrates, against the academics, and a sketch of the political doctrine of Plato. He studied general history, as we know from Plutarch's lives of Lycurgus, Solon, Aristides, Pericles, Nicias, Alcibiades, Lysander, Ages of Laws and Demosthenes, which were probably borrowed from the work on lives. But his main efforts were to continue the labors of Aristotle in natural history. This is testified to not only by a number of treatises on individual subjects of zoology, of which besides the titles, only fragments remain, but also by his books on stones, his inquiry into plants, and on the causes of plants, which have come down to us entire. In politics, also, he seems to have trodden in the footsteps of Aristotle. Besides his books on the state, we find quoted various treatises on education, on royalty, on the best state, on political morals, and particularly his works on the laws, one of which containing a recapitulation of the laws of various barbarian as well as Greek states was intended to be a companion to Aristotle's outline of politics, and must have been similar to it. He also wrote on oratory and poetry. Theophrastus, without doubt, departed further from Aristotle in his ethical writings, as also in his metaphysical investigations of motion, the soul, and God. Besides these writings, Theophrastus wrote several collections of problems, out of which some things at least have passed into the problems that have come down to us under the name of Aristotle, and commentaries, partly dialogues, to which probably belonged the Eroticos, Megacles, Callisthenes, and Megarikos, and letters, partly books on mathematical sciences and their history. Many of his surviving works exist only in fragmentary form. The style of these works, as of the botanical books, suggests that, as in the case of Aristotle, what we possess consists of notes for lectures or notes taken of lectures, his translator Arthur F. Hort remarks, there is no literary charm, the sentences are mostly compressed and highly elliptical, to the point sometimes of obscurity. The text of these fragments and extracts is often so corrupt that there is a certain plausibility to the well-known story that the works of Aristotle and Theophrastus were allowed to languish in the cellar of Nellius of Skepsis and his descendants. On plants the most important of his books are two large botanical treatises, Inquiry into Plants, and On the Causes of Plants which constitute the most important contribution to botanical science during antiquity and the Middle Ages. The first systemization of the botanical world, on the strength of these works some, following Linnaeus, call him the father of botany, the inquiry into plants was originally ten books, of which nine survive. The work is arranged into a system whereby plants are classified according to their modes of generation, their localities, their sizes, and according to their practical uses such as foods, juices, herbs, etc. The first book deals with the parts of plants, the second book with the reproduction of plants and the times and manner of sowing, the third, fourth, and fifth books are devoted to trees, their types, their locations, and the practical applications, the sixth book deals with shrubs and spiny plants, the seventh book deals with herbs, the eighth book deals with plants that produce edible seeds, and the ninth book deals with plants that produce useful juices. 
gums, resins, etc. On the causes of plants was originally eight books, of which six survive. It concerns the growth of plants, the influences on their fecundity, the proper times they should be sown and reaped, the methods of preparing their soil, manuring it, and the use of tools, and of the smells, tastes, and properties of many types of plants. The work deals mainly with the economical uses of plants rather than their medicinal uses, although the latter is sometimes mentioned. Although these works contain many absurd and fabulous statements, they include valuable observations concerning the functions and properties of plants. Theophrastus detected the process of germination and realized the importance of climate and soil to plants. Much of the information on the Greek plants may have come from his own observations, as he is known to have traveled throughout Greece, and to have had a botanical garden of his own, but the works also profit from the reports on plants of Asia brought back from those who followed Alexander the Great. To the reports of Alexander's followers he owed his accounts of such plants as the cotine plant, banyan, pepper, cinnamon, myrrh, and frankincense. Theophrastus' inquiry into plants was first published in a Latin translation by Theodore Garza, at Treviso, 1483. In its original Greek it first appeared from the press of Aldus Manutius at Venice, 1495-98, from a third-rate manuscript, which, like the majority of the manuscripts that were sent to printers' workshops in the 15th and 16th century, has disappeared. Wimmer identified two manuscripts of first quality, the Codex Urbinus in the Vatican Library, which was not made known to J. The standard author abbreviation Theof is used to indicate this individual as the author when citing a botanical name. Characters His book Characters, if it is indeed his, deserves a separate mention. The work contains 30 brief, vigorous, and trenchant outlines of moral types, which form a most valuable picture of the life of his time, and in fact of human nature in general. They are the first recorded attempt at systematic character writing. The book has been regarded by some as an independent work, others inclined to the view that the sketches were written from time to time by Theophrastus and collected and edited after his death, others, again, regard the characters as part of a larger systematic work, but the style of the book is against this. Theophrastus has found many imitators in this kind of writing, notably Joseph Hall, Sir Thomas Overbury, Bishop Pearl, and Jean de la Brière, who also translated the characters. George Eliot also took inspiration from Theophrastus' characters, most notably in her book of caricatures, Impressions of Theophrastus Such. Writing the character sketch as a scholastic exercise also originated in Theophrastus's typology. On sensation a treatise on sense perception and its objects is important for a knowledge of the doctrines of the more ancient Greek philosophers regarding the subject. A paraphrase and commentary on this work was written by Prishan of Lydia in the 6th century. With this type of work we may connect the fragments on smells, on fatigue, on dizziness, on sweat, on swooning, on palsy, and on honey. Physics we also possess in fragments a history of physics. To this class of work belong the still extant sections on fire, on the winds, and on the signs of waters, winds, and storms. Various smaller scientific fragments have been collected in the editions of Johann Gottlob Schneider and Friedrich Wimmer and in Hermann Eusner's Analecta Theophrasti. Metaphysics The Metaphysics, in nine chapters, was considered a fragment of a larger work by Eusner in his edition. But according to Ross and Phobes in their edition, the treatise is complete and this opinion is now widely accepted. There is no reason for assigning this work to some other author because it is not noticed in Hermippus and Andronicus, especially as Nicolaus of Damascus had already mentioned it. On stones in his treatise on stones, which was to be used as a source for other lapidaries until at least the Renaissance, Theophrastus classified rocks and gems based on their behavior when heated, further grouping minerals by common properties such as amber and magnetite, which both have the power of attraction. 
He also comments on the effect of heat on minerals and their different hardnesses. Theophrastus describes different marbles, mentions coal, which he says is used for heating by metal workers, describes the various metal ores, and knew that pumice stones had a volcanic origin. He also deals with precious stones, emeralds, amethysts, onyx, jasper, etc., and describes a variety of sapphire that was blue with veins of gold, and thus was presumably lapis lazuli. He knew that pearls came from shellfish, that coral came from India, and speaks of the fossilized remains of organic life. Theophrastus made the first known reference to the phenomenon of pyroelectricity, noting that the mineral tourmaline becomes charged when heated. He also considers the practical uses of various stones, such as the minerals necessary for the manufacture of glass, for the production of various pigments of paint such as ochre, and for the manufacture of plaster. He discusses the use of the touchstone for assaying gold and gold alloys an important property which would require the genius of Archimedes to resolve in quantitative detail when he was asked to investigate the suspected debasement of a crown a few years later. Many of the rarer minerals were found in mines, and he mentions the famous copper mines of Cyprus and the even more famous silver mines, presumably of Laurium near Athens, and upon which the wealth of the city was based, as well as referring to gold mines. The Lorium silver mines, which were the property of the state, were usually leased for a fixed sum and a percentage on the working. Towards the end of the 5th century the output fell, partly owing to the Spartan occupation of Decelli. But the mines continued to be worked, though Strabo records that in his time the tailings were being worked over, and Pausanias speaks of the mines as a thing of the past. The ancient workings, consisting of shafts and galleries for excavating the ore, and washing tables for extracting the metal, may still be seen. Theophrastus wrote a separate work on mining, which like most of his writings is a lost work. Pliny the Elder makes clear references to his use of on stones in his Naturalized Historia of 77 AD. While updating and making much new information available on minerals himself, Although Pliny's treatment of the subject is more extensive, Theophrastus is more systematic and his work is comparatively free from fable and magic. Although he did describe lingurium, a gemstone supposedly formed of the solidified urine of the lynx, which was included in many lapidaries until it gradually disappeared from view in the 17th century. From both of these early texts was to emerge the science of mineralogy, and ultimately geology. Pliny is especially observant on crystal habit and mineral howardness, for example.